And the Supreme Court has unanimously uh, made a decision declaring as unconstitutional the law that allowed government to impose restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parliament in 2020 passed the Imposition of Restrictions Act, which allowed uh, the president to restrict public gatherings, shut down schools, and also to impose measures to guide religious gatherings, amongst others. Law professor and human rights advocate Kojo PAJ Tia, uh, along with some eight others, dragged government to the Supreme Court contending that the said law was unconstitutional. The court agreed with this view. Legal Affairs correspondent Joseph Akaple has more. So the case filed by law professor Kujua PJ to uh, raise concerns about the process that had been used by the government to impose restrictions. He had made a point that they should have acted under Article 21 to impose those restrictions. That part of Ghana's constitution allowed restrictions to be imposed in the interest of public health and safety and crisis when necessary. But Professor Etuya took the view that using Article 21 amounted to suspending fundamental human rights in a manner that he considered unlawful. He took the view that it was important that government should have sought to control the COVID-19 pandemic by using emergency powers which were allowed under Article 31 of the Constitution. This provides an elaborate procedure for such restrictions to be imposed, including the presidency, consulting the Council of State, as well as going through various steps to outline those measures. Uh, the court agreed with his views and declared as unconstitutional the imposition of restrictions. Restrictions Act and proceeded to strike, strike out that law as unconstitutional, null and void and of no effect. Professor P.A.J. Tuya says he is delighted by this decision. The decision means that the law which was passed in the first place was illegal. It was unconstitutional. It shouldn't have been passed because there were sufficient provisions in the constitution to direct how the emergency should have been organized. We also made reference to the Public Health Act which also gives an idea of how emergencies should be organized in case there's a public health emergency in the country. And so that is what the, the court decided for us. I mean, but we know that the president over the weekend announced that he had lifted the restrictions. It, it, in, I guess it means that they will not be able to, in the event they want to utilize the law that allowed them to issue those EI, they will not be able to do so anymore. No, they will not be able to do so. But, but the case had come up earlier before the president made the, the announcement last week. And that announcement alone also wasn't enough because the restrictions came by a law. And so they are not, the government, the president just making a statement does not change the law. And so we are glad that the Supreme Court itself has pronounced that the law is illegal, is unconstitutional, it shouldn't have been enacted in the first place. We know that government has since announced that the COVID restrictions are lifted, but the law in position of restriction act is no longer a lawful tool because of the decision of the court. So it will mean that in the event they want to uh, issue any executive instrument on the basis of that particular law, they would have to go to Parliament and have the law passed or perhaps use the Article 31 emergency procedure that the Supreme Court spoke about on Wednesday. For joining us from the Supreme Court on this particular matter, my name is Joseph Akable. No, all let's stay uh, at the courts because the Supreme Court has in a unanimous decision described as unconstitutional the directive from the presidency uh, asking the former Auditor General Daniel Yao Domelevo to proceed on leave. It will be recalled that the presidency in July 2020 asked Daniel Yao Domelevo as then the Auditor General to proceed on leave. When Mr Domelevo pointed out uh, this as unlawful, his leave uh, was further extended from 123 days to 163. Uh, or 67. And now nine civil society groups decided to uh, sue the Attorney General over these directives and after more than two years the court agreed with them. Legal Affairs correspondent Joseph Kaple uh, has further details on that as well. The Auditor General was probing key government contracts when he was asked to proceed on leave. This included a controversial Kroll and Associates contract involving the senior minister. Your coach should go to PP and find out why did they ratify it? I don't see why they are on the back of my staff. For the past two or three weeks, they've invited my deputies and several officers. I think it's one of the intimidating principles or approaches being used. But then I want to assure them that they can come and jail me. We will not stop doing what we are doing. I've said it time and again that I don't fear any attack on my office. And 
<laughs> it is, I'm not alone anyway. Let me share with you for you to know that it is the, the, usually the fate of auditors general. Mm? Mm. I have a cartoon from the auditor general in Kenya where he's sitting on his seat and people are cutting so to remove him. And <laughs> they say they can't figure out how to do this. I have several other examples where uh, I don't want to mention the name of the uh, this, but the president has almost put a ban on the auditor general. Because the Auditor General is exposing him too much. In another African country. Another African country. So it is all over. The independence of the Auditor General. Mr. Dumelevo insisted the directive was unlawful. The presidency further extended the leave from 123 days to 167. This effectively meant the Auditor General was never coming back since by the time the days elapsed, he would have been due for retirement. Nine civil society organizations, including the CDD Ghana, took the matter to the Supreme Court. They contended that the directives were unlawful since the president does not have the power to exercise such disciplinary control over independent bodies. The apex court agreed with this view. In a unanimous decision it described as unconstitutional, the directive from the presidency that asked Mr. Domelevo to proceed on leave. The court also said it was unconstitutional for the president to appoint an acting auditor general while there was a substantive auditor general. It however opted not to issue any other orders since the Auditor General had already proceeded on leave and retired. This uh, matter shortly, but let's start off because there are uh, two issues at stake the COVID 19 pandemic and what we're hearing about the uh, then Auditor General. But I want to bring in Professor PJ Etia, who's a human rights uh, advocate, joining us. Uh, first of all, on the executive instruments issued then uh, by the presidency, restricting a, a number of movements and uh, also far reaching directives on religious gatherings at the time. Uh, thank you for your time, Prof. Uh, one may ask the question how crucial is this decision? Uh, but at this point, to uh, your uh, discourse and advocacy uh, on, on human rights, particularly when we know uh, that restrictions around COVID-19 have been lifted. Thank you for having me. Um, I think that the decision is very crucial to the forward march of our human rights journey because the law as it was passed did not have reference to COVID-19. And so it means that the law can be applied under different situations. Number two, the law didn't have a sunset clause. A sunset clause means that the, the, the law should have in mind an expiration or termination of that emergency when the, of that emergency law when the emergency is over. That was also not provided under the Imposition of Restrictions Act. Number three, the definition of a disaster is, excuse me, a bogus one. It doesn't, it is completely different what is in the condition in the first place. And the definition itself is unclear, it's untidy, there's some words put together, which therefore gives room for interpretation of a disaster under different circumstances. So that tells you that the law was made to stay and to be used for other purposes. And so that is why it is important that the Supreme Court has struck it down, because it could have remained even after the president had issued a statement saying that the restrictions are over. And so that is why it is important to see the decision as critical to the forward march of our respect for marriage and democracy in the country. Uh, are you worried that the ruling is coming at this time? Worried? Hello? Yes. Uh, are you worried that, that the decision is rather coming at this time? Well, definitely it should have come earlier. I mean, the case was filed some time ago, and there were a number of um, uh, postponements of the delivery of the judgment. However, it is not too late because... We don't know what, what may have happened tomorrow, where this law would have been used. So we still welcome the time and, and the, the decision itself. Uh, and for you, what's your expectation? Uh, I mean, in the nearest future, and uh, for instance, when it comes to conformity, what's your expectation from the executive? Well, we are hoping that the, the, this will be a learning curve for the executive, that they cannot take the law into their own hands. The constitution is clear. And Article 31 and 32 on 
the procedures for issuing a state of emergency. We have an Emergency Powers Act, which, which derives its source from Articles 31 and 30 of the Constitution. We have the Public Health Act, which also deals with emergencies in, a, in the area of public health. So we have all the laws there. Why government decided to go beyond that and violate the Constitution clearly in terms of taking away the powers of um, the Council of State, the powers of Parliament, and so on, and violating the rights of the people when uh, they wouldn't have any recourse to, to uh, seek redress. While, meanwhile, the Constitution Article 31 32 provides means for people to be compensated in case their rights are violated under the of emergency. So the, the arbitrary nature of that law tells you that government can take advantage of such emergencies to do what they want. What they want. And so it is important that such a decision is made to check the exercise that the executive can go into and so that we go by the constitution which we have all agreed to. How about legal reforms in terms of, I mean, in the form of legislation, uh, probably from the side of parliament, th that will also help. So we have a clear guideline on how to handle some of these things when they recur, correct? Um, at this moment, I'm not sure we need legal reform to regard to emergency powers. Mm. Like I said, the constitution is clear enough and it's elaborate enough. And then we have the, the PHA, that is the Public Health Act, and then the Emergency Powers Act. And these provisions give room for recognition of other emergencies. For example, the, under the Constitution, it talks about including other uh, situations. So it means that that particular provision is extend, uh, can be extended and expanded. So I don't think we need any law at this moment to deal with emergencies. We also have elaborate provisions on human rights. We are party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which clearly spell out the boundaries of emergencies. Mm. And it also identifies laws which can be derogated from during periods of emergency and so on. So I think we are covered in that way. And uh, of course, on the issue of the uh, Auditor General Daniel Yao Domelevo and uh, his case, the latest ruling we have. Uh, coming through. Uh, let's bring in Adam Serrano. He's the uh, co-chair of Citizens uh, Movement uh, Against uh, Anti-Corruption. Thank you, sir, for your time. Uh, you, your group was part of a number of CSUs that at the time, of course, went to court asking the courts to reverse that decision by the presidency. It's now confirmed that, I mean, your feelings, your sentiments at the time that the directors uh, from the presidency were uh, w w were not right at the time. Um, it appears that the court is affirming that, but, but it's rather coming uh, very, very late. W w will that erase the essence for which you went to court, by the way? No, not really. I mean, yes, the consequential uh, matters we had raised, which would have been to reverse the decision, etc. I mean, it's, it's time, time has passed, so that won't work. But as a precedent, it's a landmark decision from the highest court of the land it also clears his name, and I think there's a great value for Ghana. So Ghana has actually gained by, by this effort of the civil society organizations and by the decision of the Supreme Court. Doma Levo is no longer in office. What would this mean to the fight against corruption? Well, at least we know that our courts can rule and rule fairly when they know that something is wrong. It was a unanimous decision. That's great. Um, and I think that it allows us to go back to the issue of surcharges and disallowances, which the current uh, Auditor General has not applied since mm -hmm. Domlevo left. So there is some room for things to be done. Going forward, um, how do you feel this will impact or influence uh, those who are still at the uh, Auditor General's department? I mean, i.e. the successor of uh, the then Auditor General himself, uh, Daniel Yao Domelevu. Uh, do, do you feel that Johnson Akiyama and, and the rest of the team there at the department may be strengthened, encouraged by the latest ruling that we're seeing? In one sense, yes. In another sense, no, because the, the ruling also says that the, the government should not have empaneled 
um, some somebody else whilst there was a known Stephen um, Auditor General. So there are consequential matters that will have to be looked at. So in one sense, yes, that the Supreme Court upholds that this should not have happened in the first place. Uh, but now we're going to have to figure out whether uh, his appointment, therefore, is substantive, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there is a positive part, and the part which is a bit uncertain. And, and going forward, um, for Tom Elavo himself, well, at least we've not heard from him yet, uh, he may be speaking uh, later um, uh, on the Joy News uh, channel, but uh, f what, what, what kind of posture do you expect from him now? Probably an apology from the, from the presidency to him, or w what else do you feel should be happening? Yeah, and I'll not be able to, I mean, Mr. Domelvo will have to speak to what his thoughts are, um, but I'm sure you'll be happy that his name has been cleared. Mm. Okay. Uh, grateful for your time. Okay. That's uh, Adam Sanano. He is with the uh, Citizens Movement uh, Against uh, Corruption. More survivors of Tuesday morning's uh, road crash on the Goma uh, Ochoiko Road on the Accra Cape Coast Highway have uh, started uh, sharing that distressful detail of how a fuel tanker uh, ran into uh, their car, killing some passengers, including a baby. Uh, one of them, who only gave her name, as Juliet says, she was asleep uh, when the deadly crash actually happened. She says that uh, a stampede followed the accident, with many of the passengers stepping on her injured body until she crawled out to safety. Uh, still unclear the number of people who actually died. The Winneba Municipal uh, Fire Service Commander says 16 people were sent to the morgue. Other, uh, others uh, also uh, indicate uh, that some um, six people died on the spot. Maxwell Agwakba has been following up on that story and now reports. I am at the bus terminal where the driver of the U-turn bus was headed. Here, I've met an executive member of the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, Bob Hagan. He lost his friend, Clement Ejapon, and two others. He was at the morgue to see them. He says a dual carriageway for major highways is the solution to the many deaths on, on Ghana's roads. The conductor is the one leading the, the car from Liberia to Ghana. So yesterday he called around 8 o'clock in the morning that he had uh, a libel. So when they go through with the custom processing, they decide to even rest some, for some time. So we are all expecting him later this morning by even 8 o'clock. Uh, that is, that is a, a, a cremant to Japan's body. The yeah, one leg, one hand, the body has been divided into two. So it's very painful. It's very, very painful. My, my brother and friend and colleague died a painful death. I wish him, may the good Lord keep him in the Abraham person. But one thing I noticed it, our road is single road. If this road is going to be something double road, I think sometimes the way this, our uh, bus driver was dodging this tanker driver, because the trunk, uh, tanker driver misses road, he loses control. So our bus driver, that's Musa, was trying to dodge. Behind me um, is the Eton bus that was involved um, in the crash being towed away. Even as it is towed away, some residents um, and colleagues of the people who died in that crash cannot control their emotions here. One of the people who died in the crash, Clement Japan, worked with Babs Transport. Emmanuel Japan is the secretary of the company. He says dual carriageways or divided highways save lives. You know, the road should be just be, I mean, dual carriage. I mean, the Accra Cape Coast Road should be made or should be dual carriage. That is all we want for now. That is exactly what we want. Because, you know, I can't just leave home to feed home and all this happens to me. So our plea to the government is that that road the Accra Cape Coast or Accra to, I mean, Accra Cape Coast should, should be dual carriage. Um, here at the Accident and Emergency Ward at the Buneba Trauma and Specialist Hospital, family members of some of the persons affected by the crash are gathered here, waiting with bated breath for them to be discharged. But right here in the waiting area, um, you can hear occasional screams of pain 
as the health personnel here treat um, the victims uh, of, uh, some of them you're told have um, a femur uh, fracture, some of them um, dislocation of their um, shoulders, some of them they have dislocation of their hips, um, some of them have deep lacerations, uh, deep cuts on their faces and other parts of their body. Yeah. It's a lot of pain. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, she had agreed to speak to us earlier, but in this state, I, I don't know if she would still want to talk to us. I really remember because I was sleeping. Mm. I only saw myself almost on the corner. Mm. But people were just stepping on me. People were stepping on you? Yeah, to, people were stepping on me because I was sleeping. Mm. So I not told myself. They all are close. Mm. But when I, they come on one hour, I know that. Mm. I will ask them. Binta survived the crash. She says she was asleep when it happened. I was sitting two seats after the driver. Two seats after the driver. Two seats after the driver. So I almost fell asleep. I was sleeping. So the boss and the tanker just met face to face. And I just had the noise. I stand up. When I stand up, I watch. I said, Jesus, accident. Accident, I'm dying. So like I came down the bus because it, one of the, one of the side of the bus finished. So I came down, I begin to shout, come and help us, come and help us. Six people die at the same spot. About three men and three women die at the same spot. You saw them? Yeah, I saw them, I saw them. A Futu MP and Deputy Majority Leader Alessandra Afenyo Markin says it is imperative that Ghanaians come together and prioritize the safety of our roads. He's urging the relevant authorities to conduct a thorough investigation into the circumstances surrounding the crash. He says this will allow for the identification and enforcement measures that will prevent similar incidents in the future. Uh, today, there's a global uh, celebration going on uh, to mark uh, the World Tobacco Day. Uh, of course, the day is set aside to reduce uh, tobacco use around the world. Ghana is participating in these uh, celebrations as, and has, uh, been, as has been done all over uh, the years. Now, uh, it's on the theme that we need uh, food, not tobacco. And uh, it is a source of... Uh, uh, some number of issues and a series of uh, illnesses uh, for many, including lung cancer, heart diseases, stroke, and a lot of respiratory diseases as well. A study uh, conducted by the NGO Vision for Alternative Development uh, indicates that as many as 804,000 Ghanaians smoke uh, cigarettes every day in 2015. Executive Director for uh, that association and the National Coordinator for the Ghana uh, Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance, the Bram Musa, uh, will be joining us uh, shortly. But just uh, take a listen to some, some of the views on, on the streets of Accra about this whole issue uh, relating to the use of tobacco. It's great. That's why I'm saying that you see the right for the box that is uh, smokers die young. So as for me, they should ban uh, cigarettes. I know plenty people they smoke cigarettes, but as for me, it's not good. So they should ban. I think People shouldn't allow to smoke publicly because uh, those who heal also are also affected. It's not good. It's not good for our health. Uh, Why not? Uh, because even it is written on the, the, the cigarette box that it can cause harm to your health. So I would advise my colleagues out there not to uh, engage themselves in it. Uh, okay. Some views there on the uh, issue of tobacco use. But as we celebrate the day, uh, obviously the theme is that we need food, not tobacco. Abraham Musa is here with us. Uh, thank you, sir, for your time. Well, uh, the theme itself speaks volumes. Uh, but many who say tobacco is addictive, so those who are using it may not see the essence of exactly what you're talking about. 
Well, uh, it's not entirely true, but let me, let me, let me greet your, your, your listeners right. and, um, or your viewers as well. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, I, I must say I agree with the, the guy who was speaking. I mean, uh, the point is this. There are many advocates who have advocated for that uh, a predator has no benefit. Yeah. I mean, whatsoever. Whichever way you look at it, I mean, it should be banned. I mean, entirely from the world. But unfortunately, that has not been the case uh, because uh, many are citing issues of you know, smuggling and the fact that once something is banned, control is very difficult. So we need to put measures to ensure that people willingly, you know, are able to stop, you know. So the, the point is the, the issue of the, the nicotine, you know, the, the industry themselves, I mean, the, the manufacturer themselves knows that that is the, the evil, the in thing within the tobacco products. So they, after producing the product, they, they then inject, you know, the nicotine inside, just so people wow. are unable to stop smoking. Because they know that one, there's nicotine, then once you smoke, then you are hooked to it. So and so and that is that is the notion. So once nicotine is reduced or is taken from tobacco, the tobacco product itself, then automatically you have people, you know, I mean, I mean, having their, their way through without having to smoke. So every every you know every manufacturer finds a way, you know, to inject, you know, or mix mix the product more appealing to people. But I've not, I mean, tried smoking, or I'm, I'm not a chain smoker, so I'm not able to tell the ingredients and how the feeling will be. But without nicotine, what is research telling us well, so, about, uh, about, you know, that, that feeling of it when you don't have that element in it? Well, so, um, you know, um, tobacco contains about 7,000 chemicals, you know, 7,000, I mean, you know, and um, most of them, about 50, 59% of them are cancer-causing cancer agents. So for us as civil society organizations or advocates, mm -hmm. or even public health advocates, uh, we don't seem to recognize the, you know, the, the, the any benefit that whatsoever that there is when it comes to tobacco. But of course, people who smoke will tell you that, you know, it gives them some kind of feeling, some okay. kind of appetizer, you know. But of course, um, all of these are just, I mean, worldly things, you know, that, and of course, nobody will willingly go and smoke. People who smoke will tell you that uh, it is as a result of either peer pressure or results of some activities of the, of the tobacco industry, like advertisement, mm. you know, um, the cost of the product which is very cheap in the market, and the availability. So it makes people, you know, easy to assess it. And once you see your stars, you know, I mean, movie actors, you know, singers, then people tend to emulate, you know, that kind of behavior. And the industry have used, um, you know, and used that to actually ride on and getting more of the youth to, to smoke. So, so what sort of reforms uh, are we on the lookout for now? And by extension, your group, your alliance, what would you want to see in terms of the concrete changes? Right. You know, I was here some few, some few months ago um, talking about the fact that one of the measures that um, government all over the world are putting in place has to do with, you know, taxing this unhealthy commodity, especially tobacco products. And indeed, I'm, I'm happy that at least uh, Parliament was able to pass the excise duty I mean, the bill. So currently we are going to see some, you know, I mean, level of rise in terms of taxation, you know, on tobacco products, which means the product is going to be a bit high, which, you know, prevent the poor, young people and children from getting access. And then also, you know, today's World Tobacco Day, we are raising awareness. We are calling on government to as much as they can, I mean, government all over the world, as much as they can to, you know, to activate the sections of the Female Convention Tobacco Control. WHO Female Commission Plan, that actually, you know, specify or giving direction to many governments on how they should, you know, try to support farmers. And in that directive, are we losing sight of some key factors? No, in fact, I must say that in Ghana, we have made some progress, okay. but the progress, I mean, uh, stands from the fact that, you know, we don't grow tobacco in a country anymore since 1996, we stopped growing tobacco. So that have made, you know, the, the, the growers, you know, to reduce. So, but as of 2015, we're having about um, 500, almost about 600 farmers, growers in the country. Unfortunately, however, government and all of us, we've not prioritized the alternative livelihood stuff, where we want to see how we can support farmers to shift from the growing of, you know, I mean, this product like tobacco, which has no benefit, as I mentioned to you earlier, to the growing of, you know, other sustainable, you know, food crops that will sustain us and sustain the economy. I can tell you that because so much hectares of, of land, I mean, is used for the production of, of tobacco products. If you're able to channel all this land to the production of good food, I don't think we will have problems. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are calling on our, on, on our authorities, especially the NAPCO, you know, that, and the, uh, is the food and um, something, I've forgotten the, the, the team that the government is currently, you know, implementing. Planting for food. Yes, so. so that if they can also look, look at, because farmers, there are farmers in Ghana who are still producing tobacco products, mm -hmm. 
And when they produce the leaves, they transport them to other countries for the purpose of, you know, I mean, like Nigeria and that stuff, for the purpose of growing this tobacco. So the point for us is we want government to channel its energy there and invite or bring, I mean, the, the program on board. And let's see how we can support those farmers to shift from the production of, you know, I mean, tobacco growing. Because it, it also has its own effect in terms of, I mean, you know, um, working around it. Mm. You know, it has some diseases that the farmers themselves go through. Children are poor because, I mean, you have to work on the farm instead of going to school. You know, it comes with so many challenges. And then also, it doesn't fetch, you know. But the point is this. Many farmers complain that they don't have any alternative. That is why in the minds of framers of the Framework Convention to Tobacco Control, WHO, they came up with guidelines on how government mm. should be able... And there are so many support, support programs, even globally. WHO has programs that they can support government. Unfortunately, Ghana have not taken advantage of it. So as we mark the One Tobacco Day, we are calling on government to activate that session and then see how we can collaboratively work together to support our farmers. And this will go a long way to reduce, you know, the menace and then the disease that uh, you mentioned earlier, mm. uh, cancer, the cardiovascular diseases. Right hypertensions and stuff that uh, we are faced with. When it comes so, to so how is it that in spite of, uh, I mean, toughened policies, we're, we're not able to control this uh, tobacco use? Well, so you see, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's a legal product. The tobacco industry um, also have, you know, and for their lobbies, you, you, you imagine what happened in Parliament before we passed the, 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 the public, the, the, the excise duty bill, for instance. For me, I was disappointed that uh, we have to go through voting for us to get a public, public health, I mean, aspect of our, you know, and the argument has been that this will protect our children from getting, you know, addicted to tobacco use and stuff. And we have to go through voting. In this tells us the call, there are lobby groups. They are, the tobacco industry themselves are, are lobbying. They are, they are doing their own advocacy. We even have civil society organizations who front for the tobacco industry. As I speak to you, I will not be surprised if we also have counter, you know, civil society groups who are also promoting, you know, other aspects of tobacco products. And this is not good for, you know, for us. So the point is this, um, I know government is trying its best, but indeed the industry would not, would, would not sleep. They will also find means and ways of reducing the extent to which government will put, you know, tough or stringent measures to reduce the, you know, the, the effectiveness of tobacco control. Currently we have a law in Ghana, but the effectiveness has become um, not so much in terms of implementation. And process. while you make the effort at uh, tackling or controlling and possibly minimizing the use of tobacco, uh, there are those who are still living with the complications of it, uh, of its use, um, addiction, and, and all, all forms of uh, complication. Are, are you mindful of these sects of people who are still reeling at the, under the effect of tobacco use? Indeed, let me say that that even came out during the National Commission where um, the Ministry of Health was taxed to. Mm -hmm ensure that at least um, they, um, they support, um, you know, the, the, the district hospitals, the psychiatric hospital, and hospitals have been dedicated to support people who are suffering from, from addictive substances, for instance, tobacco use. So, they, for instance, Ghana passed um, a physician guideline mm -hmm. in 2017, for instance, that has also seen, not seen much of, of, of implementation. But the point is that then there are, you know, uh, facilities within and various hospitals where people can be taken but, but is it that high? I mean, the, the, just to, to, to make a case for why you're pushing for, for this no tobacco day. What? When, you mean whether there's a case? Yeah, yes, precisely. No, no, indeed there's a case because, I mean, um, the GI will tell you that, uh, I mean, Ghana still imports millions of cigarette products in the country. And we, got, we get it consumed. So, and government is also getting much revenue. So it tells you what they call it. The problem that we are facing currently, and we are told by some, some, some doctors that every Friday, if you see the cases that go to the hospital in terms of hypertension, in terms of stroke, in terms of, and most of these, these, uh, these conditions that go to the hospital are as a result of these unhealthy commodities. And tobacco is number one. You know, because people are now abusing the product. It's very cheap in the market. You go to the market now, I mean, if you have 50 pesos, you can, you can buy a stick of cigarette to smoke. And now, you know, shisha. Shisha has not taken all over, you know, our youth. And that is the, the most dangerous, you know, aspect of it. But because shisha has not been there for a long time, we are not seeing that look the, the, the real effect. Mm. But trust me, we are calling for government to ban this product, including electronic cigarettes, that our youth are becoming so much obsessed with. And this is as a result of, you know, advertisement. Advertisement on TV, radio has been banned. But unfortunately, social media is where it is. And then one other thing is that uh, our celebrities are also not helping the kids. 
you see most celebrities who are also smoking in public, also using shisha in public. So the point is that what you tell your, your, your team you supporters who are, who are following you, definitely they would want to emulate what their role models are doing. So we're also calling on, you know, on these celebrities to be mindful of the fact that for you, you have the money. If you get the cancers, the, the whatever, you can fly and get treatment. What happens to your team in youth? I mean, who are, who yeah, are, who are not? But there's also the com uh, commercial implication of this, a reason for which what you're looking for in the form of an outright ban may not come anytime soon. Well, for yes, so, so the discussion has not begun. We call it the end game. Yes. Um, it, in fact, we don't see it to come very soon, mm -hmm. but we are actually. Uh, it, it's, it's unlikely that it may even well, come. Well, well, but uh, no, it, it, it would eventually get there. Are you, are you certain? Yeah, we are very certain that it will get there because a more awareness is creating. It's, it's, it's being created. created yes. Because even the, the tobacco industry, they are moving away from the traditional cigarettes, you know, like I told you, to more innovative stuff. And they call something harm reduction. But the point is that uh, we're, not, we're not talking about harm. We want a tobacco-free society, a tobacco-free world, so that we can all live happily, you know, devoid of these diseases. So indeed, um, yes, for the end game, is that the conversation is, is, now, is now going on, but we want more stiffer, you know, regulations, laws. But the point is that uh, our policymakers, our governments will stand firm and resolute, you know, and don't listen to the industry. Because, like I mentioned earlier, a product that does not have any benefits, we don't have to entertain you know, such an entity at all, whether commercial or, or whatever, because they only look up for their interests, and not the interests of me and you, our children, and every other mm. person. For some, you're simply attacking the product itself uh, when you could go after um, persons, uh, approach the issue with some level of moral situation, tr trying to appeal uh, to, to these group of persons who are going for tobacco not to use them. Okay, so you see, the female commercial tobacco control, you know, um, has given, in fact, it touched on every aspect. So there's a target for the industry, we are calling on the industry, exposing them of, of the fact that because they claim mm -hmm. the product is not, is unwholesome. Yes. They claim, even they themselves have promised that they are going to stop the production of tobacco. But in the time we, we are getting closer, they, they shift their goalposts. You know, so the point that they have admitted that the product is very harmful and very deadly to our, to, our, to our health. That's why they're coming out with other, you know, alternatives. But even that, those who are, are even more dangerous than the tobacco itself. And the fact that the, the smokers or awareness creation is also ongoing on radio, on TV, raising awareness of the youth. And that is why I always say see, it's a concerted effort. Civil society, government, um, clinicians cannot do it all alone. We need the media. We need our celebrity to support a healthy cause. I'm, I'm looking for a celebrity who will come and say, fine, I am here and I now want to support the other cause, the cause, you know, to stop, I mean, our youth from, from, from smoking. But like I said, you rather find them rather smoking, you know, in public, I mean, glare. So if, if this happens, it will be difficult to reach, I mean, our, our goal of, you know, so the point is that we are targeting the, the, the industry. We are also ensuring that we are monitoring government reactions, government action, just as we saw during the, you know, and the passage of the excise tax on tobacco, for instance, the whole world have seen, you know, what our policymakers are looking out for instead of um, public health gain. So the, the point is this, um, yes, so there's naming and shaming, mm -hmm. which most civil society will do. We expose government, we expose the industry for unethical behavior. We also expose our own civil society organizations who, for whatever reason, support, you know, um, tobacco, I mean, you know, tobacco industry and their, their products. What's the way forward? The, the, the next set of activities we should be expecting from your coalition, uh, just to drum home the points that you've been making all these years. Right. So you see, public awareness is very key in whatever that we're doing. Unfortunately, because of the the ban on drumming, and we're, only, we're not able to you know to to have a kind of mass this thing. But um, together with FDA and civil society, we are planning to do. As I speak to you now, the commission is also done in other regions. So. All the region, regional capitals are also commemorating the War on Tobacco Day. It's a form of raising awareness. So we have a program where, you know, throughout the year, it's going to be awareness creation, engaging people, engaging students. Indeed, today we had a, a, a quiz competition, you know, right. where students were involved. I mean, just to continue to raise awareness, give them understanding of, of the harm of this product and how practically we can, together with them, you know, reduce the, the, the menace of tobacco. How about the appeal that you jointly combat this uh, menace? And uh, the fact that you have uh, the youth also, also resorting to other forms of addiction, which is also drug use, by the way, aside tobacco. Uh, and the feeling is once you push them off tobacco, 
they may be moving to the alternative ones. Right, so, so it's, it's unfortunate. That, that's also a concern to you as well. Yeah, yeah indeed, it's, it's a concern. That is why, uh, you know, when the excise duty bill was passed, for instance, you know, it included taxing, you know, electronic cigarettes. And in normal circumstances, electronic cigarettes are supposed to be used for cessation purposes. So that in the event that somebody, I mean, uh, want to stop smoking, you know, the clinician or the doctor will prescribe. It's a prescriptive medicine, right? But now that it has been, you know, given the... The, the, I mean, the fact that um, GRA can now begin to tax, then the industry will now have the opportunity to, to bring it. So yeah. we are even calling for, for amendment of that particular aspect, just so we can have um, is it electronic cigarette, the new product that we are talking about, I mean, to still be, you know, be used as, you know, as a situation instead of for recreational purposes, right? So the point is, it, I mean, it's a big challenge for us. Shisha has come. There's no much regulation of opposition. Many countries have banned Shisha. But the point, the point for us really is it all boils down to our policymakers. You know, when our policymakers begin to understand that this is, is, is a disease that has befallen the world and Ghana, as many countries are putting so many measures, and they are reducing the prevalence of, of smoking. Though smoking is not very high, but it's growing gradually. So the point for us is there are many countries that are doing very well. They are reducing the prevalence. Rwanda, Kenya, they have all banned shisha because they are seeing the, I mean, an epidemic before them. Yeah. Why can't we do the same? Lavram, we need to go, uh, but, but let's not leave without talking about public smoking. It's also uh, a form of the challenge because, yes, I may decide not to use the product, but someone else's decision to use it could affect me in public. Right, so thank you very much indeed. I'm very happy about this. Um, I mean, let me use the opportunity to say that because we have a public health act and then part six is the tobacco control measures. And it also has a, a, a provision that, that states that require tobacco smoking, is, public smoking of tobacco is banned. So the point is that uh, smoking is banned in Ghana. I'm talking about public smoking. Oh, really? Yeah, it's banned in Ghana. You can't smoke in public. Yes. You can only smoke in a DSE or DS, yeah, DSE, which is called designated smoking okay, room. So, so there should be a spot, so there should be an area yes. where, where you can do it. And that. this law was passed in 2012. Mm -hmm. And yet? And yet, so, you are, so, so, so that's the thing. I, I, I'm not sure if, if, you are, if you are aware or even your yeah. listeners are aware that the smoking is banned in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So anybody who smokes, you see someone smoking, he has violated the, 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 the laws of Ghana. But the point is this, if for instance, enjoy, I mean, your studio for instance, there's a smoker who wants to smoke, it is incumbent on the management, you know, to then, you know, come out with a structure. Mm. where the person can go and smoke. So that least it doesn't affect me and you yeah. who have said not to smoke because... S certainly not close to the, to, to the newsroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely <laughs> not close to the newsroom. Not to the newsroom. And the point is, I see, yes. if, 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 even when the law was being, was being done, we, 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 we told government, I see, there's no way you can kill smoke in that. Smoke cannot be killed. There's no mechanism that can kill smoke. Mm. Smoking will definitely come. That's why when you go to some, some facilities in the country, for instance, there are many facilities that have the necessary smoking room. I, can, I don't want to mention the hotels, yeah. but the point is this, they have smoking rooms, but they are violating the rule because they're not able to, once you open the door, the smoke can come inside, yeah. you understand? So you are still affecting people who, who wish to sit. And inhaling that, according to research, is even more dangerous than, than actual smoking. As well. well, so you see, um, well, so I will not dispute that yes. because yes. once you puff it out, as yes. I can call that, it, it comes in contact before you inhale it. Yes. But the, the, the point really for, for us is mm -hmm. tobacco kills, you know, 8 million people right. annually, where secondhand smoking also kills about 600,000 people annually. Right. So the point is that whether you so are it's also inhaling, a significant figure. Yeah, it's a significant distance. That's why we, we call it, that's why we call it on parent especially because the law did not go into the homes of people. Fine, there's ban of smoking public places. So the argument is, so is my home a public place? If a husband decides to smoke, question. and there's a woman, there are children, mm -hmm. what becomes of that? Because then it becomes like domestic violence bill. The point is, the woman can, or the man can choose to report the, the husband or whoever of smoking, but the point is, will, will you be able to stand the other call, the, the, the repercussion, yeah. or let's say imprisonment, or finding your husband? So then it becomes, you know, so the point is, it's about increasing awareness, getting children to understand also tell, talk to their parents that indeed this is a nuisance to me because right. as you smoke, you are affecting your, your, your child, even the unborn baby, if your wife is pregnant. Uh, Labran, we need to have this conversation once more, but certainly we've run out of time. Thank you.
uh, for spending some time with us here on Thank the Thank you very much for having Indeed. me. And I wish you the very best, hoping that you'll be able to get government to do their needful. Uh, but as we speak, hundreds of uh, people have masked up at the premises of the National Identification Authority headquarters here in Accra uh, to get their Ghana cards on the final day of the deadline of the SIM card deactivation. With less than nine hours to the deadline, the uh, desperate uh, customers have uh, expressed frustration over their inability to get their SIM cards registered. My colleague uh, Jocelyn, uh, Jacqueline, I should say, and Zuma Yaboa uh, has been to the NIA headquarters and comes through with this report. Hundreds of people have flocked the premises of the National Identification Headquarters in Accra with the hopes of getting the Agana card registered before the deadline ends today. Now, a lot of them chose to disregard the various timelines that were given earlier. As you can see behind me, a lot of people have thronged here today to get the Agana card. All right, so um, where did you come from here today? Um, I'm coming from Winneba, but I'm from Upper West. Sisala West constituency. Yes. Right, so you have you registered your SIM card? Not yet. Have not because I've not received my Ghana card. How long has this been? Oh, that was 2020 when I registered. I've not received my card up to now. But did you go to where you registered? Yes, I registered at Winneba. That was the first the, the registration. So I've been going, they keep on telling me they are working on it. The card is missing at the headquarters. I have to go, go and come, go and come. Uh, all of a sudden, last week I went, they said I have to come to the head, head office. Uh, if I come, I should tell them that my Ghana card is missing. So I came here in the morning, 3 a.m. It was raining. All the rain finished on us. You know, they have been given a lot of deadlines. Especially, I know for the NIA, they've actually opened their doors for the registration. But when it comes to the SIM card registration, there were lots of deadlines given. Yeah, because I've been, I, I also try my best. I've been going there, instead of for them to tell me the truth. If they were telling me the truth by now, I would have got my Ghana card. Um, how many times have you been here? Three times, from Monday to Wednesday. Just this Monday. And why did you wait till now? Or you are just are you coming here for a fresh card or no replacement? When when did you lose it? 2021, which is 10th April. Yeah. And you waited because there were lots of deadlines, especially when it comes to the SIM card registration. There was lots of deadlines. But I waited because you see going to work up and down. And then I was I wasn't aware that there'll be something like SIM registration with your Ghana card. Basically I didn't take the Ghana card seriously like that, but it's now that it has come to an emergency that you have to come for. Okay, and so far what this morning, what has been the response from the NIA team? No response. We are still on the queue. I'm coming from Clotel Kole Osu. And have you, is this your first time or how many times have you been here? I've been here for 14 times. Wow. And what has been the issue? The problem now is I've gone through all this process and I'm done with everything. I've made the payment twice. The first one, I wasn't able to get a code. The second one, I was able to get a code. And I came here for the biometric process. After two weeks now, they said they cannot find my card over there. And I don't know why they, 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 they were not able to get my card over there. Because I'm wondering, they've taken my money twice. Up to now, I'm not getting the card. Okay. But have you, when it comes to the SIM card registration, have you gone through any of their processes yet? Uh, yes. I, uh, already, I was having the Ghana card. But through the SIM card registration, I wasn't able to register my, my, my SIM card because I was having problems with the Ghana card. And the problem too is not coming from me. I don't know the system that they are using over here. Because this is the situation whereby ordinary Ghanaians, we are not able to get this, this Ghana card. It should be something simple for us to get it. Ma'am Pasha, and then the Uba? Me, ID card in Sinamiba. Now, why the Dadana? I am a voter. And I'm a bass, and I'm a woman, and I'm a man, and i Na me card in the Sulu. Timasa call voter. You call voter almost me, 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 head office. Me, baha three times and nay three times. Na me, baha, me, be de line, et cetera. Last me, baha, say, almost see me, a police form, and yet me, Pierre, and una me, tofum. Na me, yare, and see, mint me, ye, mint me, ye, me, we, no cardinal. See, and then so my saba, that the day one line, so we are not boys, sir. We crop on me, yare. Be cardin, we won't hear your pants. We won't be before we marry. Now, what SIM card? No, what SIM card? No, what register? Yeah, me register. 
Tisa unim say one rate where in Ghana card ni na ye be blocking ochina anaji. Ben be any day. Iti na ye pa umu chao si ye pa umu chao umu block ya ye be any day. So ye su ye Ghana ni. Me Ghana na umu wo mi mi mami ni mi papa ni ni na umu free Ghana. Mi ni baby ako na umu block mi we nu. Be adi anu so umu ye mami. De bi ana mi 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 kwa ya juma katra na mi dia ba hasi na mi dia fruka. Me bi ami free wa enya hana mi free mi free akra hasi. Mi kwa vota umu ye mami masaba hasu still ah. Sim omo omo be a omo coin so many times for people to register, but one year, oh change. Me de kobe bia ma ye photocopy, me de kobe bia omo si omo ntimi ye mami. Photocopy no omo ntimi ye mami. Ti se mi nya card na nkasa kasa. Ti card no, ene ha mi ntina ye mi ba ha se. Three times si ni. I've lost my Ghana card, so I'm here to do re-registration, to reprint my card. Okay, but what about your SIM card? Have you registered? No, I've not registered. So it means that today, if you don't get your Ghana card, it's getting blocked? Yes, please. So what has been the response from the NIA team? The, it seems that NIA team do not know what they are doing. They have my information already, and they have a scanner. The moment you scan, your information is supposed to appear on the computer. But it's like they ask a lot of questions. We have been here more than three hours, but nobody's responding to us. But is this your first time coming here? Yeah, this is my first time coming here. Why did you wait till the deadline? I was in, I'm in the Western region, and I've tried so many times to register my SIM card. When I go to say uh, the reprint card is not available, when you go to the reprint card is not available, since uh, tw uh, 2022, December, my card got mixed in. I've tried so many times, nobody, is, it's like you don't have the clue, because it's like the information they collected, they don't, they don't have the information now. I talked to one lady, I said that they are doing update on their system. I don't know the kind of update. You have already printed my card for me. But I don't see the reason why you are collecting another information to do my reprint. You are not worried about your SIM card. Because others, if they don't get their SIM card today, it means they, they are getting they deactivated. I don't have the Ghana card. not even been registered for the SIM card yet. So you said you've not registered for your SIM card No, yet. no, no, yet. Because the Ghana card is not ready for me to register. They the gave a lot of deadlines, but why didn't you register your SIM card that long time? That you are waiting till now before you register your SIM card? But when the Ghana card got lost, we are in the preparation. When did it get missing? The when did your Ghana card get missing? Oh, since last three months. And they had been given a lot of deadlines even before last three months. But at first, the district centers, they say you paid... Uh, I'm talking about the SIM card now, your SIM card. You were saying that your Ghana card got missing last three months. And yeah. I'm asking you right now that they were given a lot of deadlines even before your Ghana card got missing. So what stopped you from registering your... No, your I, I didn't register my uh, SIM card at all. I didn't register. What my were you waiting for? Oh, I got the Ghana card not late. It, it, three days time and then the Ghana card got lost. That's why I didn't register for my SIM card. Just as you heard from distressed registrants, the process here is not easy. And at the end of the day, the fate of getting their SIM card registered lies in getting their Ghana card. Reporting for Joy News, Jacqueline Ansuma Yeboa. The Executive Secretary of the National Ident Identification Authority, Professor Ken Atifua, says uh, plans are in place to ensure that the eligible persons who are worried about the situation get their cards as he reviews that all complaints about double payments for cards will be investigated. So far, I don't know how many people are here. I know that they are in the hundreds. And um, NIA's seven capacity at the head office here, which is a premium registration center, is approximately 600. So in the best scenario, you can do about 650, 700 in a day. That's our setup capacity. Yesterday, we served more than a thousand because toward the end of the day, I realized that the numbers of people here who had been so distressed um, could, with some ingenuity, um, be accommodated. I directed accordingly that every nook and cranny, every space available, ought to be deployed and used, and the personnel and um, material resources found. So we were able to serve the people. I've given similar directions um, for today. But it um, disrupts the arrangements that had been put in place. It involves a banking service that has to be 
um, respected. A banking service with protocols and procedures that have to be respected. But yesterday, we had to make an exception and get regular accounting staff finance department or directory staff go in and take cash contrary to our arrangements of people paying with a token paying with you know a pin and um, making sure that accountability and and responsibility is without question um, but we had to do what we had to do in order to accommodate the situation today we will repeat that performance we'll do our best but i do not know how many people are here and I do not know, I cannot guarantee that they will or can all be served, especially because it is a deadline. I understand that there are about 11 million SIM cards that risk being um, deactivated out of about 36 million or so. Um, and, and, and so we know how many roughly, about 25 something that have been done. And what it means is that across the country, we will have pressure at the NIA premium registration centers in Koforidua, in Kumase, in uh, Takrade, and on the uh, Kwame, on the Independence Avenue at the Kalbank um, head office. We will put our best foot forward, apply our best energies, our best intellect, and our best efforts in the expectation that with that level of focus and vigor and commitment that we'll be able to serve the greatest number of Ghanaians possible. Um, we don't charge twice. So if there is an exceptional circumstance, refer it to me or to any of our officers and we deal with that. There are people who fib. There are people who say things that are sometimes, just sometimes, untrue. There are people who come here and hear stories from third parties and then repeat them to the media. Say, I went to NIA and I was told, and they've not spoken with anybody from NIA or working at NIA, but depending on rumors and hearsays from third parties. So let's be fair. If someone has paid for a service, there is no way NIA will charge the person a second time. If NIA has misplaced the person's card, NIA is a responsible and responsive state institution. And there are rules and regulations passed by parliament governing how we conduct our business. There are policy guidelines or directions pro pro um, um, provided by our governing board that direct us how and what to do. So in those circumstances, we will obey the law or the policy. We will not subject a person to the tyranny of double payment for a service for which they are entitled to as a matter of free cost or as a matter of a single payment. So let's isolate those things. Let's deal with the real issues. The person who says I have been asked to pay double, that's a complaint that warrants investigation. And thanks for staying with us here on The Pulse. We'll return shortly with more stories. And you're welcome, Mark. The Kwame Nkrumah Circle, named after Ghana's first president, has gained popularity for varied reasons, from being a hub of selling stolen phones, swindling pedestrians, and prostitution in Nkrumah Circle stands tall. Now, these activities, many believe, are in sharp contrast to what Dr. Kwame Nkrumah stood for. Joy Primes, uh, Shola Adeyemi, and uh, Joan Nyame have uh, more in this report. <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah Circle, named after Ghana's first president. Places like this offer unique insight into the lives and legacies of the people they are named after. They also serve as a reminder of the contributions to society. But what perception do people hold of the place in Nkrumah Circle? A place where you sell mobile phones and also I heard because of this I shall, I run a prostitution. If you are with something and you don't hold it to all, <laughs> then boom, like, you won't see it again, yeah. How they swap phone into something else. Exactly, yeah. You may not be wrong in describing this place as an electronics hub. From phones to laptops to computers, Nkrumah Circle is the surest place to get them. But you may have to be extremely careful in making sure you get value for your money. 
ya me to me credit ya e won se matena ha che mi mo mo so ban na sada ne mi nim do de fa me ni so to me ji e mi me credit ni mi se ka ko ye mi a matena mo a che no mo de aye me ba se me su anyansa circle is also home to most of the traders here most of them do not only work here they live here and so do the thieves from for no mo ha too much o to me ya juma bre atans o bet ma da no ma pai o bottom no ra se no o ma pai me brother be ayi ni 850 Ghana CD. I want the bottom. Normally, like they know us to be bad people, but that's not it. You understand? Because they think we are thieves. You understand? Because of the phones we sell and all, and because of the past experience some people have had over here. You understand? You understand? Yeah, but we are not thieves. Obia, beko bebi anase bibi bia uinya bia ope bibi a ope ato bia uinya bi. Ewa ha. Kwame Koma is the epitome of political excellence. He is the touch bearer of Africa's liberation battles. But the crime, petty theory, congestion, and all the tax associated with Circle and its tiptoe links are a dark reflection of what Kwame Nkrumah really stood for. And yet, I shall phone in the neighbor's sister, a dean. Was most of the sana, Obu Hoya Hoho. Obeba, or see what Matisse says, Sacra, Kwame Kuma, Betana Hana said, the circle be to Kwame Kuma, they were in. Then I will catch any panel, so who so? I don't know your circle, no. Ten years, some profoundly say, I can say, the best is some. I have Kwame Kuma, Dina, if you circle there. Sebi and Dina, that's what I say. Now, I say, if you are a parent person, being so, a Dina, I'm so they are fine. Oh no, I be a boy circle. I'm a year to me, and who never be brave. So, and see, if you are not, you better Kai, your papa, so John Mahaman, you obey your mind. Hey, overhead no I think we need to maintain it though because it was named after someone who fought for us. Police visibility has improved. Police personnel can be seen at vantage places providing security for all. Some individuals we spoke to believe the rampant stealing around this area has reduced. Boys, boys, you know. Enti ama kro no sem na susu kakra ene fa so te ya obe nwa no ma twumo bi fun no mu didi mrika ene a moto ya o ma be park park wa hen ene o mu dwane a o mu di obi fun no mu di dwane a moto fun en su timi chensi wo eya a police fun an kitu o timi chensi wo e ma o mu kwa di moto ni eyi fun ne ba akron fun na do fun wa ha dodo ye wi adam pale na nsem o o mu di police fun be gum e ma o mu blasi the circle the old folks know is no longer here. The fountain that stood in the middle of the roundabout is dry. Perhaps so has the dignity that should be attached to this place. But Nkrumah and his great legacy live on, whether thieves tiptoe here or not. Juan Nyame and Lois Adeyemi's report for Joy Prime. And Vice President Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Vahomia is uh, mourning the passing of the 85 year old uh, Madame Dari Pogo, a cured leper at uh, the Garungu Monturi in Wa West municipality, whose uh, conditions were highlighted in a Joy News documentary in 2020. This triggered a national conversation which led to the Vice President providing the woman with a two bedroom house. I will share with you, of course, a tribute uh, from the Vice President soon. First, here's a story uh, we told of the deplorable condition of uh, Madame Dari Pogo, uh, which got the Vice President acting. On a dirt compound is a thatched roofed mad house. Out of it, a frail looking old woman emerges and walks towards a mango tree to get fresh air. Her name is Dari Puga, a woman possibly in her 80s living alone in this part of the village with her 13-year-old granddaughter. Dari Puga suffered leprosy at a younger age but at that time she did not know what it was. She used local concoctions in the hope that she would recover but over time her condition worsened. She has lost all her 10 fingers and from afar you might think both hands have been amputated from the wrist. She remembers exactly how one after the other she lost all her fingers. Uh, yes. Local medication, a black concoction she used to smear. 
Okay. Yeah, he used to smear the body. And, and did, did, did she know it was a medical condition or? Unless one year daughter will ye. Unless over ten minutes you go out a daughter and pee fall. Car daughter Mineka in Tim Bukabe. A lamp and quarter of a young gas. Say initially they sent her to war when the condition set in. And that time uh, the Upper West wasn't developed as it stands today. And she went there and they said, they wasn't medicating us at that time, and she came back. I'm on board, but I'm on board, but I'm on board, but I'm on She said the experience is that uh, it will swell. It will swell from the digits, and it will start chopping off from the digits to a digits. Call them phalanges. One phalanges to the next phalanges to the next phalanges till it reach the palm. That was how they start falling, and that was the beginning where he can feed himself. Leprosy affects the tissues, uh, especially the cartilage, and then more importantly, affects the nerves. Now, when the nerves are affected, it means that there is loss of sensation. Okay? It's not loss of mobility, although there is to some degree, but largely loss of sensation because it's the peripheral nerves or the nerves um, that are on the surface, if I put it that way, that, that are affected. Which means that you do not feel pain, you don't feel sensation. For that reason, um, you can injure yourself and not realize it. Okay, So they end up with sores and with ulcers that eat away at the flesh. The disease in itself also technically eats away at the flesh, the cartilage and the bone. Mm. And so over the years, you, you get the uh, digits or the extremities receding. And that's where you end up with this club-like uh, features of the fingers or the toes. And for this old woman, it appears the disease has also affected her eyes, so she tears up unknowingly. She manages to clean those tears with her disfigured hand. Daripuga has lost four of her ten children. The rest hardly visit. In fact, for over five years now, none has visited her. All she has now is her life and her granddaughter. She goes to bed without any idea where her next meal would come from. Until good Samaritans pass by and offer them food. Daripoga says at times they sleep on empty stomach. <laughs> Uh, okay, what basically she's saying is that it's, it's food, if she get money she can buy food and cook and eat, she's happy. Apart from that, what again does she need? That's what she's telling All she needs is daily meals. Daily meals. That's what she said. Uh, apologies, but we'll bring you uh, that message from the Vice President uh, later on. Uh, we can now take you to the headquarters of the New Patriotic Party. Uh, more uh, nominees uh, and their supporters are picking up uh, uh, forms to file to contest for the presidential slot of the governing New Patriotic Party. This afternoon, a group of uh, individuals are doing so on behalf of the Trade Minister, Alan Kujutre, Martin, my colleague Samuel Mbura is there. Uh, we take you live there now. Sami, what can you report? Eric Osetifo. He is the national president, national chairman of the Tumitu Celeste Association and several other queen mothers from a number of the markets in Kumasi and in Accra, Makola and the rest of the women. In your mind, Shanene Waba, Ake, Boni Nyevie, Nyehan Nyevie, Mo Ibami, Ake, Womami Me, Niho, Ni Ye Jan. They are different, different. I'll try my gun. Ni Wache Alachamatin, Ke, Lehu Ibaba. Ni Ibadamoshi, Ne Wolf Lager, Nokaha, MPP, 
nye ke meni yo kumansi ke gana eh make self eh ake nye ba ba together ni nye ba he forms enye hale no he wo wo ke wo wo hie wo nye wo che alan campaign here wo be wo ba wa nye ko ni wo twon nye gbe ni wo ba party eh headquarters ni wo wo ba ya ma me ahimanum ene ya papa chairman asemu amukan ya abode share bo se ebre no dura ye wura lanche matin de mo ana be di kan abeji forms atu ahoka e di amanu na be jina se mpp frank atufuo ene gana president no ye nsu ye ni so ye ni di wura lanche matin campaign ene ma no nti na se di di nkomo no ya bo amomo abe dru ha nti na amade ewu ni se ye bo party mpanyimfo amane e pani a Okay, party abatu any a hundred hundred any nonsense we are as you share few more as well research one name of us here events ni marco ura ya mwa oye 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 for penny or ha jena secretary in the boa for stronko and ka woman is on your introduction na mami mama to know handy also what we need now actually so then ya ba se o hima o di kumase tomatoes a gedifuo e kan ya na na comfort se wa ono en wote me bin kunse ono na mi na kire mo a hima fo ni yura eh eric kunse to fo idne chia ene ya ba be dru kai inti na de aka no medane de ama ya na hima na mejidi se senior o hema atena na dwamu a o ka ni traditional language ne de na mo be pne ye kakra na o hema so ba ke twi ndi we de med mase Naima, ready? Me Daniama. Catch up, me das. You are busy for the money now, mas. I walk in here, me dia mai. The family na abna se wa comfort. Me na me asante ready to mantus hema. Na me ni anu ma me no fi kumasuwe so ya hema fwa. Omo se da bibia tu bibia ano. Ena akra hema fwa so wa ha omo se abe support to jubedi a yebidi. Na yera. Alain, quand tu as matin, tu as dit que 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 tu as dit I'm passed so. I'm passed so. Me ne mahema fui ni na ya kambum. Eni jodi fui ni na kambum. Emi ya jiji sika. Eni ya more than one billion. Titi sika na me kana me nini. Tumi tumi kambi aba. Eti ya jiji sika ni wia yero. Eni ya dekwa bank. Eni ya diko kutia eka. Ena five hundred million titi diyo. Eni ya diko kutia. Any other receipt? Any other ever said about the crater come on your line? What the abejja or oh my Ghana name? I, I the president, you know, am I? So they say, I say, Obia, you say, a dead year somebody, your power line there, on to two years ago. Now, something I'm going to buy, and you say, no, yes, I'm going to phone you, dead phone you, I did so. You got tough, you got tough, you know, said we tough for us, no, and the amount, your papa. Na ya papa de obi ani tua se ono de ne de ye dwedi fo ma de oni ye ho agoro na gana ha bibia so be koye dwedi e ye first sa man we se dwedi ni mkura nka ye ntim nko ye nim se e ti se da oba ya wo se ma dwedi a ye fe na sai we ni kino ama ye ni age ho papa papa e ti e se ahema fo ye wo ha yi ye ma and then, uh, yeah, most of them are yeah, delegates. 
It's your best delegate. I want to have one. Say, 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 don't pay. Say, you are a human force. I am thinking. Yet, maybe say, you are ready. Eko biya. Obiya ba wasi alai. Wa amadi I am to have. Ala ama I am to have. Ala ba I am to have. It's your strong delegate. I am with Hamada Roma. Mumwaye, oh my, you come in a bit. Mumwaye. Okay. I can't. I can't. I so, Blazer, you just heard one of the um, Queen Mothers. One of the Queen Mothers uh, of the tomato sellers in the Ashanti region. Uh, she's explaining that. And then uh, a contest. They made a pledge that they would contribute and then bring their resources together and then purchase a form for uh, Mr. Alan Chairman, the former Chris Minister, because he is one of their own. So they are just basically redeeming their pledge of purchasing the form for him. So they have contributed um, from the markets in both Kumasi and Accra. They were able to raise over 100,000 Ghana cities and they used 50,000 to purchase the form. So they are strongly behind his candidature, a reason they have left their work to come and then ensure that he goes through the entire process. So those women you see there are the market queens from both Kumasi uh, in the Ashanti region and here in Greater Accra. So they are optimistic that with Alan being the flag bearer of the MPP and subsequently leading the country, he'll be able to take us out of the current economic challenges that we are facing. It says they are doing this for their children who are, are yet struggling to find their feet in, in the economy. A reason they have to come out, um, come all out to support him. They see him to be the rightful candidate to lead the NPP. A reason they have shuttled themselves all the way to the headquarters of the NPP. So they will be presenting the draft to the uh, elections committee of the NPP. Then uh, afterwards, they will come and address the media. But I've seen notable persons of the NPP, uh, like the former Attorney General, uh, Mr. Ayukwe Otu, is here to support the team. The former General Secretary, Nana Ohini Nto, is also among the delegation and a host of other former national executives and former appointees of the NPP government. So um, what I am learning is that after picking the nomination form, they would be submitting it to Mr. Alan Chamante at his office, and then he will address them and then tell them the way forward. I will hand over back to you in the studio and definitely bring our listeners and viewers up to speed what is happening at the head office of the NPP. Pleasure. Uh, Sami, if you can hear me, the, the question about uh, others who have filed uh, as well or picked up the nominations for, for today. We, we know that yesterday at least two individuals did that. Uh, for today, is it only Alan who's picking up the forms or his supporters? Exactly, Blazer. Today is only Alan Chemantinda has come to pick his form, adding to the number eight. Yesterday, there were seven. With Alan coming in, there should be eight. The party leadership, in an earlier conversation I had with them, indicated that they are expecting about nine of them because in their public conversations and posturing, they have shown interest, but they are yet to officially come and pick the forms to contest. So with Alan coming to pick the form, we are still expecting at least one person because that's what the party is expecting, about nine. However, the party is saying that any qualified interested party member uh, can also come and pick the forms at 50,000 Ghana cities. You know, the nominations are opened till the 24th of next month. 
that they will close it and then the vetting and then everything uh, i mean the filing vetting and everything will kick start okay but but any word from the national leadership of the party on on what the next steps may be after this phase So um, before the picking of the nominations form, I engaged the director of elections um, for the NPP, uh, Gary uh, Evans Nemako, to find out from him uh, what the party is doing after the picking of the nominations. He said they are still waiting for others who are interested, as I said earlier, to come and pick their forms. But another concentration of the party has to do with the Asin of uh, by-election. Earlier, I asked um, Mr. Evans Nimako, uh, he said that the forms, uh, I mean, the forms for the contest for that election has been opened, but he was unable to tell me the number of people that have picked forms as of today. But in my interaction with the National Communications Director of the NPP, Mr. Richard Ahiagba, he said two people so far have picked nominations to contest in the uh, Asin North uh, by election or to represent the MPP to contest the Asin North uh, by election. So that is what is in the offing. The party is looking at the picking of the nomination forms whilst also focusing on the Asin North by election. Earlier, the national youth organizer also addressed the press and then declared their intention to storm. Uh, that's what he said. They, their intention to storm the constituency and campaign. Uh, to get a seat for the party because he believes that the party has done enough for the people of Asin North in the central region and for that matter they will be rewarded with the, the, the seat. So they are urging party members to uh, actually storm that constituency and then campaign for the party to win the by-election that is in the waiting. All right, my colleague Samuel Mbura there from the NPP headquarters. Uh, he'll be bringing us up to speed with uh, all the happenings there as a group of uh, market women have uh, picked up the nomination forms on behalf of uh, the trade uh, and industry, former trade and industry minister, Alan Kujutrim, I think will uh, definitely bring you updates uh, because we understand there's a press conference uh, up and ahead. We'll look forward to that. Uh, but back here in the studio, the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, uh, Ghana, uh, Reverend Dr. Stephen Wengam, has uh, raised concerns about churches putting up beautiful edifices at the expense of the development of members or congregants. According to him, uh, much uh, as state-of-the-art uh, church halls serve the, uh, of course, as a traction for followership, it is incumbent on pastors uh, and also church leaders to inculcate holiness in their members. He spoke at the uh, chapel dedication and 16th anniversary of the Trinity Temple of the Assemblies of God uh, Church located in Tewa. Trinity Temple Assemblies of God from its humble beginning endured all the obstacles starting with eight members in 2007. Over the years, the church has grown from strength to strength. As part of its 16th anniversary, Trinity Temple is dedicating its new edifice, which has over 1,200 sitting capacity. Delivering his sermon, the new superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Reverend Stephen Wengam, is delighted for this achievement. However, he says, it is of no value if the beauty of the edifice is not reflected in the lives of the church members. He says, Christians must lead a holy life, citing Romans 1 verse 4 and other scriptures to drum home his message. What makes you a Christian? What makes you a man of God? Should not be your title or your degree. Head Pastor, Trinity Temple Assemblies of God, Reverend Sylvanus Elom, who led the church from the onset believes God has seen the church through it all, and same would happen in Ghana's current situation. If God gives you a vision, he makes provision. And so he brought men and women who had resources, who had substance, and they came and they supported all the way. We have never gone to the bank to raise one city to build this edifice. We have never gone outside to ask people, come and share this function, give us money. Every money was raised internally here to the glory of the Lord. Meanwhile, 
Group Chair, First Car Group of Companies, Eric Sadikutoche, who was project manager for the construction, prays the church becomes a place of refuge for those who seek God. Is the Lord has made the provisions, both the financial provision, He has given us the strength and the tenacity to be able to do this, to only to His glory. And today we are only here towards to honor God with this edifice. And it's our prayer that if anybody is troubled, and when he comes here and seek the face of God, God will answer him. Chief Justice nominee, Her Ladyship Gertrude Tokonu, Justice of the Supreme Court, His Lordship Victor Jones Doche, Professor Frempo Manson, among other dignitaries, grace the occasion. And since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Germany has uh, promised to beef up its uh, lackluster military. Uh, now the German defense minister uh, is under pressure to also make that happen and uh, succeed where his predecessors have failed uh, the gauge, uh, uh, to actually gauge his chances and challenges. Uh, we're joined now by uh, William Glucroft, uh, who's the reporter with our partners, DW in Berlin. Uh, thank you, uh, William, for spending some time with us. Now, Germany's uh, defense ministry recently announced that the minister will attend a major defense summit uh, which uh, will take place in Asia. Uh, what's the purpose first of all of this uh, trip and why is he participating? And good day from Berlin. Yes, Boris Pistorius is the current German defense minister. He's been in that post for a few months now. And it was announced that he will attend this major uh, Shangri-La, it's called Shangri-La's uh, defense dialogue in Singapore coming up uh, very soon. And uh, his participation in a very high level event, you know, for example, the uh, defense ministers of the United States and China will both be giving speeches there to present their rather competing views of security in the Asia Pacific region. The Australian prime minister will be giving a keynote address there. So Germany's involvement is, is more of a symbolic act to show that Germany means business, that it really wants to, you know, up its game, so to speak, uh, in terms of global engagement, in terms of its both diplomatic and its foreign policy and its security policy engagement in places even as far away as, uh, you know, in the Asia Pacific region, which historically, traditionally, is a very, very far away, not only for Germany, uh, but also uh, for Europe more broadly. Now, this is largely symbolic. You have to remember that the German government, since it, the current one came into power at the end of 2021, has been promising a new national security strategy or a national security strategy at all. This plan was supposed to come out already weeks, if not months ago. There still isn't one. The government is still bickering over what exactly Germany's national security strategy should be. That leaves uh, someone like Defense Minister Boris story is kind of in the lurch because he's trying to lead or set policy for Germany's armed forces. But on the political side of things, they're kind of he's kind of, you know, throwing the ball to himself, waiting for what the strategy is actually going to be going forward for the government. Uh, and I'm just wondering what's standing in the way of uh, Germany meeting the promises it made to improve uh, military capabilities. Right. Well, Germany has a long reputation, an embarrassing reputation of just having a, a, an armed force that doesn't really work. Helicopters that can't fly, airplanes that are, are out of service, tanks that don't really work, uh, rifles that don't shoot, even getting things as simple as uniforms, the right kinds of uh, equipment and clothing to soldiers uh, has been criticized as too difficult. There are many levels here. Uh, you know, immediately there is the bureaucratic one. The, the bureaucracy of procurement has been criticized as being incredibly slow, uh, full of red tape. The, the procurement agency here in Germany as 11,000 workers. That's six times larger than the defense ministry itself. And that's been criticized as just being too slow and not really having a focus on speed and getting the troops what they need. That, of course, behind that is the lack of political will. For decades, Germany has not really taken its own security very seriously, seen as having the United States basically to provide its security for it. And that, of course, is against the backdrop of Germany's own militaristic history under, not, uh, under Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, its lesson from the Second World War was war is bad and you shouldn't engage in it. The Russia's invasion of Ukraine has altered that idea a little bit to the understanding that, well, war is bad and we shouldn't engage in it, but there might be bad actors out there that need to be confronted. 
Uh, and that has sort of, you know, woken up Germany to the fact that it does need to or thinks it needs to provide more for its own defense. And apparently the 50 billion euros on average that it's been getting for its defense budget uh, is, is clearly not enough uh, to meet the needs that Germany and Europe and the United States are expecting of it. Really can achieve its uh, security goals. Uh, what geopolitical implications will, will this uh, have, for instance? Right. This is the big question, right? Germany has long been promising, at least for you know a year and a half now, this major turning point in how it's viewing itself in a geopolitical and, and, and security strategy perspective. Now, you know, Germany is looking to not only provide defense for itself, but its European allies, especially against Russian aggression. And the United States is looking towards a country like Germany so it can start to refocus uh, its own security strategy elsewhere around the world, especially in the Asia Pacific. So it's not spread thin. So the United States is itself looking towards Germany to sort of pick up the slack a little bit. But it's important to note, you know, there are critics here who are saying this is not about how much money is spent, if we, that just spending more money is the answer here. It's about how well the money is spent. You know, for example, the economist and uh, historian Adam Tooze was in Berlin just recently, and he told an audience saying, look, Germany spends 50 billion euros on defense. It has all 100 billion euros of extra money for defense that it's just uh, gotten in the last several months. And the European Union taken together is one of the largest uh, spenders of defense if it was all taken together. The problem is that a lot of it is not coordinated. A lot of it is not strategic. A lot of it is not thought about as one unit. And if the European Union, for example, example, could get together and procure equipment and use its money and resources more as a single block, that would be a much more effective use of the money that already exists rather than just ratcheting up the budgets overall. So there's a lot of uh, questions to be remain, that remain open here about how exactly Germany and Europe more broadly really go ahead with its own security future. Mm. Grateful. Uh, and thanks, William, for joining us. And that's all we have for you here on The Pulse. I am blessed as we can log on to myjoyonline.com. We have uh, stories there for you. Thanks for watching. This is Let's Talk Showbiz.